Welcome to On the Brink with Andy Simon. Welcome, welcome, welcome our audiences, whether you're viewing us or you're listening. I'm Andy Simon. As you know, I'm your guide and your host. My job is to bring you people who are going to help you see, feel, and think in new ways, and then do. And today's guest, Dr. Emily Springer, is going to help you do just that. And as she said to me, it's more than just seeing and feeling and thinking. You always have to do something. And I always leave out the do because that's your job as the audience. Let me tell you a little bit. She's smiling. I'm smiling. This is going to be a rich and delicious conversation today because Dr. Springer, Emily, is a, a socio-techno person, and I'm an anthropologist that specializes in helping organizations and the people inside change. That's what a corporate anthropologist does. And after 22 years in business, I will tell you, change is painful, but it's coming and fast. Who's Dr. Springer? Emily is recognized as one of 100 brilliant women in AI ethics. This is 2024. That's why I'm so excited to have her here. Uh, I'm just excited to have her here. She serves as an expert on UNESCO's Women for Ethical AI platform, and she founded Techno Socio Advisory, an inclusive AI advisory company. She's a responsible AI advisor focused on building AI policies, processes, and programming with the aim of improved livelihoods and social justice. It isn't just about the fourth industrial revolution. It's what does this mean for all of us who are going to be living through it? This is really interesting. Her AI advising, go to many clients, Data 2X, Athena Informatics, but she also has something wonderful, the Inclusive AI Lab, that she runs an algorithmic literacy training for the everyday professional, folks like us, that builds an understanding of AI using concepts and tools instead of math or coding, which is cool because I use AI all the time and I'm not terribly interested in how they do it. I'm just excited that I can use it. And I don't know whether it's true or false, but the whole world is becoming a chat GPT world. Um, this is wonderful because the premise she has is AI for good, social impact and diversity, equity and inclusion is very important. And I'm doing some research on how belonging and inclusion are being impacted by AI because humans are herd animals, they want to belong. And how does this new technology begin to enhance that, not simply threaten it? I want to look at the positive. There's always a challenge. Um, she focuses on tech and social good. But most interesting, she's trained and mentored graduate students in development practice and social justice programs and undergraduates in technology, society, and globalization. Emily, thank you for joining me today. It's truly a privilege and a pleasure, and I'm so glad we're together. Yeah, thanks so much, Andy. It's an honor to be here with you today. As you know, my audience and my my guests understand the first thing let's do is why is it so important to listen to Emily Springer? Dr. Springer brings to you something so rich, but I'm going to ask you to tell about her journey so that you can put in context what she's doing now and why it's so meaningful. Who is Emily? Great. Thanks so much, Andy. So yeah, a lot of different sort of confluence of factors have allowed me to arrive at where I am today. So for those of you who are listening, um, as Andy mentioned, I'm an inclusive AI consultant. And this is really something that I'm trying to get off the ground. It's not as if this is something that's been going on for years. Um, I almost need to help companies and organizations and teams understand that they may need inclusive AI advising. And so that is really interesting. You have to help people uh, really realize that they might need a service that they don't know that they need. <laughs> and so how I sort of came to be in this spot of building and setting up this business, uh, essentially I was trained as an interdisciplinary sociologist and I have always focused on international development. And so I have spent a large portion of my life over six years living and working in Ethiopia, which is a country um, that I hold very near and dear to my heart. It's a place that I have worked at building cultural and linguistic fluency. If you have any contact with international development, you probably know that it's really interested in taking something that works in a single location and scaling it. And I have always kind of gone against the grain on that. I believe that especially if we want to work on improving livelihoods, we need to be thinking about 
how people in a single location define their own problems, what they see as a problem, what they want to solve, what do they actually want? So for me, development is something that is very locally situated. And so this question of scale is always something that I have uh, sort of grappled with and it comes back up in the AI world. Uh, so really this strong sort of focus on people, organizations and how we can create and instill sustainable change in everyday people's lives around the world. Um, that sort of, I'm going to go way back in time. Uh, as a kid, I actually grew up in Minneapolis. I went to Minneapolis public schools. And at the time that I was growing up, there was actually a busing program going on. And Minneapolis is the recipient of different waves of immigrant and refugee populations. And I really got to benefit from that. So as a young child, um, my classmates were Hmong and Vietnamese. And in high school, my classmates were Oromo, which is a group, an ethnic group that lives in Southern Ethiopia and Somali. And so I have had this sort of like multicultural uh, experience ever since I was a little kid. And I think that that's really informed how I think about AI and really what's at stake. So I'll pause there. Well, you know, I've been to Africa uh, three times. I was going to go my fourth time when COVID hit. And we've been to South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Tanzania. I've not been to Ethiopia, but as an anthropologist, I am endlessly fascinated by the creativity of humans. And to your point, um, what works in one place doesn't work at all in another. And if you don't build it from the mindset and the stories of the people who you're trying to help in some fashion, you miss the whole point. It isn't about what you bring, it's what they need. And as a corporate anthropologist, I learned that right out of the starting gate. You know, when I said to people, I'm a corporate anthropologist, they rolled their eyes. I said, what do you need? I need to change. Oh, I can help you. And they didn't have any idea what I was going to do. But it wasn't what I did. It's what they needed. So let's go back, though. After you worked in Ethiopia um, and you had this aha moment about how it wasn't about scaling. It was about meaning and meaningfulness. Um, was that with AI or was that with some other thing, something else you were working on? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, I got really interested in numbers. So in international development, uh, generally large donors set up performance metrics for, you know, to measure the, their investment in a particular project or program. And so you, you end up with monitoring and evaluation systems that I wanted to understand what's actually happening as a result of these monitoring and evaluation systems. And so I started studying essentially how people react and respond to metrics. So if you're a student at the university, you might want a good grade. And so that idea of a quantitative metric is actually going to change your behavior. Mm -hmm. And so I really started studying the social processes of quantification. And I looked at that from rural projects in the field and followed those up through sites of aggregation and said, what's happening at each site that people are touching these numbers, thinking about these numbers, creating documentation. And that actually is an amazing lead in to AI uh -huh. because it helps you think really critically and thoughtfully about what these numbers mean, what's not in the numbers, what's behind the data set, what is the social context of this data set and how that then might influence what actually shows up uh, later on down the line if, a, if an AI model uses that data. So there was sort of this interim period where I was really interested in numbers. And I looked at my dissertation research was looking at that with respect to women's empowerment, which is something that I think is very localized and socially embedded. And yet when you quantify it, you have to define it. And so we have this circumstance where very well-intentioned people um, in global metropoles, so Washington, D.C., London, places of historical power, uh, basically get to define what women's empowerment is and then push that indicator out around the world. And there are lots of really good reasons why you need to do that. Um, so I'm not saying we shouldn't measure. We do need data. Um, but I think we need to be a lot more thoughtful about the social processes that happen around those numbers and sort of take that into account and perhaps identify moments where local communities could play a role in determining what metrics uh, they're measured by. 
Yes, it's so interesting. In my first anthropology course many years ago, as, a, as an undergraduate student, I heard, out of context, data has no meaning. And what you're saying is that the metrics were necessary for the funders and for those who empower who want to demonstrate that their activities are doing good, what they expect. But for the people who are being done to, they may have no meaning at all. They may be out of context. They may define differently. I recently did some research for a senior living community. I had two of them out in uh, Oregon. And they asked me to come in and evaluate what quality really meant to the people who were living in their centers. Because the quality data that they were using basically said they were all threes. They couldn't figure mm -hmm. out why. They really were just plain old average. It didn't matter whether it was a high-end one or a low-end one. So what did quality really mean? And the woman who hired me was the CEO of 20 of these facilities. And I said, why don't you come and spend some time with me and listen to what they think is quality? Oh, my goodness. And as I recorded them and transcribed them, she said, well, this has nothing to do with what we're, what, what we're capturing. I said, no, but it is what they're telling you. Um, and it is defined in the eyes of the beholder. How fascinating. Yes. But her, her, her whole world was being defined by one, and they're living in a whole different one that has nothing to do with each other. You yeah. and I have such interesting paths, which is why this is so much fun. So after you came back from, so I'm not going to let this be about me, it's about you. When you left Ethiopia with this world, this real understanding of the data, um, how did you migrate then into the next stage in your life? I'm not going to say where you are now, but how'd you, how, how are you moving along? Yeah, absolutely. I want to respond to that, but really quickly, I just want to say something about the meaning of data. So if the meaning of data, uh, you know, at one location, it means a lot, I wouldn't say it doesn't hold meaning for other people. It holds a different meaning. Mm, yes. And in the case of numbers and metrics in international development, what I found was that to the people on the ground who have to work with these numbers and have to deliver against them, it felt ridiculous it yeah. felt silly. It felt like it was pulling them away from the really good local work that they wanted to do. Yeah. It meant that their local knowledge didn't have a place. It silenced them. It changed their entire orientation to the work. Yeah. And so there are ways in which it takes on entirely different meanings. And that's why people talk about in international development metrics as colonialism, and so there are all that, like, it has heavy meaning. It's just not the same meaning. Um, That's beautiful. I'm so glad you made that because that that then leads us into the use of data by everybody, you know, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, certainly, you know, I've been in the field, like in the field, yeah. I put that in quotations. It's very colonial language in and of itself. Um, so I had been living and working with Ethiopians and loving life. Um, and I actually went to a conference in Washington, D.C., and everybody was talking about blockchain technologies and AI. <laughs> and one, it felt so disjointed from what people are thinking and feeling and experiencing in Ethiopia. And to that point, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the United Nations for a conference and I had the privilege to be chatting with this Egyptian uh, parliament member. And I said, oh, what are Egyptians thinking about AI? And she said, she grabbed my arm and she said, we're thinking about eating. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It was <laughs> such a great moment for me because it helped me realize that I had come from Ethiopia to this conference and been like, there is this massive disconnect happening. And here I am years later. And even though I have all this rich experience and I'm constantly trying to represent and think through what farmers would think about this AI project or that AI project, here I was becoming part of the apparatus. Yes. And I think we all need to be thinking about that every day as we get up and go to our workplaces. What do we want to be contributing to? How are we becoming increasingly socialized by the people, the processes, the policies around us? We can never, ever forget, especially like I think about AI in a global context. We can never forget that our experience, many, anybody who's listening to this podcast has access to technology. You are in the global minority 
our experience, our shared like hyper technological experience is the minority. This is not what people around the world are thinking about feeling like this is this is not their reality. And we need to really keep that in mind if we want to figure out ways to make AI work for everybody. Well, I, I can visualize that Egyptian woman grabbing your arm and quietly saying to you, we're thinking about eating. Because, I mean, talk about the dis, this, but has always been the disconnect. You know, it's about having in rural America, having access to the internet so you can do Eve business and not have, you know, it all disconnect. I mean, we are not exactly equitable in our access to all the things that the technology can provide within this own country. You know, and so yeah. you have all the socioeconomic and rural and urban and, and IT areas and non, so that it isn't, it isn't, we, we're talking a lot about it, and I love blockchain, um, but but it isn't as if it is equitably available and, and how it's used or abused is going to be serious conversation. Yes. yes For you, absolutely. as a leader in this field, you're training people, you're, you know, your lab is doing all kinds of things. You know, what are you doing and what are the priorities that you and the folks you work with are thinking about? Because you are an early agent of transformation and information. I don't know what you said to the Egyptian, but I'm sure you didn't say, oh, but you need AI to eat. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> you could have, but I don't think that would have worked. <laughs> um, no. Well, and I, and I don't believe that, um, which is interesting because I also work, I'm kicking off research projects around, you know, what are right uses, what are appropriate use cases for AI in the agricultural development space. So I've worked a, um, a lot with smallholder farmers and sort of looking at women's empowerment and livelihood improvements in agricultural development. So that one, that's also why that one hit me, hit me yes. so hard. Yeah. yeah. So I think we all need to really pause and think a lot more critically about AI. AI is such a power game and we have an opportunity. We are alive at the moment in history when yes. humanity adopts AI. We're not to this sort of like super intelligence yet. We're not to general AI. But, you know, we've been watching these sci-fi movies for years yes. and they'll reference like, oh, you know, 500 years ago when the robot wars happened, you know, stuff like that. And that's not to I, I don't want to focus on what could happen tomorrow. There are very real risks happening today and they are not evenly distributed. And that's what I focus on. But I say that to just highlight that. Industrial ages are moments when everything is changing. New norms are getting created, new policies, regulations, laws. We are deciding right now how, as humanity, we want to relate to AI. And I really think this is a key moment to make sure that you understand what's happening. I think AI literacy is very low and I think something dangerous is happening right now, which is there are a lot of people who don't know what AI is, but they're talking about it like they do. We are at like the top, top, top of the hype cycle. And as any anthropologist or sociologist knows, like once you create a culture, once you create an understanding, then you have to deal with that. You can't easily go back. If something <laughs> is incorrect, you have to then deal with that. Um, and so I would really encourage people to work on building up AI literacy, not only as an individual, but as a citizen around the world, we're going into democratic elections and we have misinformation and disinformation, deep fakes. We need to understand what those are so that we can be thoughtful voting citizens in our workplaces. We are having, you know, our, our, I've, a lot of workplaces that I'm aware of um, are really interested in using AI in different ways. And so you've got CEOs pushing, like, how are we going to use AI? <laughs> and I would say that if we can push back in teams, in organizations, and to say, hey, let's really get this Let's let's try to get this right. This is a key moment. It's not an opportunity to just jump on the bandwagon and go. What we're seeing and what I think is a huge problem 
is that corporations are deploying models that actually haven't been well tested. They haven't been well thought about. And so in the tech sector, you talk a lot about minimum viable product. And I think the bar has been set so low for AI builds and what constitutes a minimum viable product, they're just releasing things that have very disproportionate outcomes by race, by gender. Um, and so we need to raise that bar. And I loved, um, I think it was just last week, Lisa Stromberg on your podcast was talking about, you know, in history, we're switching from shareholder value in corporations to stakeholder value and thinking about that sort of relational piece and what companies are delivering to society. Where is that conversation in AI? That whole shift that Lisa just beautifully identified is lost in the AI world. It's getting regressed all the way back to sort of just a total uh, shareholder focus. And I think we all need to be saying, but we want a stakeholder model. We know that profit isn't everything. And so I think we have this sort of moment where capitalism is going to pull this forward and it's going to regress back to shareholder value. And I think it's a great moment where people can seize the day and in every interaction, in every team meeting, in every way you can, we need to build the norms. We need to build the world we want to see with AI. And that takes our involvement. You know, I'm thinking about Eisen Stromberg's podcast and for the listeners um, it just came out. Um, today is mm, the 12th. I just posted it. Um, that's the second time I've interviewed her, but she has a model in there on leadership that I want to refer to because it's so timely. It's this new generation of leaders. I hate to say the world is in your hands, um, but if you can think about the initial conversation we had about Ethiopia and the metrics that were coming from colonial powers, from the big guys who had the money, and the shift today, if we can move from the shareholders to the stakeholders, what kind of leaders do we need? And so her research and her book, Intentional Powers, is just terrific, but they want to be humble. Hmm, that's so interesting. What a great word. They want to be curious. So we don't really know what we don't know, but we make up lots of stories about it to make us feel really smart, but we really don't know what we don't know. And when you want to be empathetic, which is a powerful word, so that I can feel your pain because I'm with you. Your brain hates to change, uh, but you're going to have to. And then they are accountable to the team, not just to mm, shareholders. There's something different going on. We're going to do this. What Emily's talking about is being accountable to society. You know, taking a responsible role so that I'm not just going to do this because it's good for my bottom line, but it's good for us as a we. Um, and then there's a resilience. My goodness, we have to, I, we, if you look back over the last, my lifetime, how many changes have we adopted? And how, if you look over the last couple of hundred years, you know, if we're in the fourth industrial revolution, it's only a couple of hundred years of all of this happening. And then there's transparency and inclusivity. And I don't think that those, that this hardy model, um, that their research is a new leader. And, and, and in some ways, Emily, you're one of those new leaders, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And you know that what came through in your learning in, in Ethiopia was out of sync with, I got to eat. <laughs> I mean, there's sort of this kind of humility that's coming. But as you're looking at your own role as a leader, um, my hope is that you don't get frustrated and just go for the, uh, the bottom line. But, you know, there's something that's inspiring you, isn't there? Yeah, I, I believe very much that we need to be having a lot more conversations about inclusive AI and how to get this right. And so, you know, for those who are listening, I just want to give a, a, a simple example. I often say AI has the potential actually to upend a lot of the social progress that has been made around the world over the last 50, 100 years, you know, we've been working on getting stronger women's rights, women's legislation around race, around religious protections, around ableism and discrimination, all of these sort of efforts, so much time and energy has gone into those. And suddenly, 
power is changing. Power is shifting. We see more women in the workplace. We see more women still not, still not where I'd like it to be. Um, but yeah. there's, there's progress there. AI does have the technological capacity to upend that. And not on my watch, not on my watch, not when I can see this coming. So one of the things in sociology that I love is that you sort of take an idea and you follow it through to its logical extension. Like, where does it actually go? And that it, it sort of enables you to think really critically about, do we want this thing right now <laughs> that we're dealing with? And so an example, and this is an old example, several years ago, Amazon tried to build a machine learning model that would review applicant resumes and decide who would get interviews. They thought, you know, we'll train it on the resumes of the people who already work here. And they created the model, they deployed it. And they found, actually, it was deployed, it was already out there deciding who should get interviews and who should not, that it was disproportionately not recommending women for roles. Mm -hmm. it, 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 like, it was making statistical associations between, you know, it's common in American society to put women as an adjective to a sport or to a chess club or whatever it is. And so it was looking, it was, it was analyzing essentially the resumes of who'd already worked there and said, oh, we don't have a lot of like captain of women's baseball team. And even that we use like softball and baseball. Those are gendered in yes. America. Yeah. And so essentially they deployed this and they were, they, they then realized uh, that it was essentially discriminating against women and they tried to fix it. Pause for a second. Amazon tried to fix it and they <laughs> could not. Okay. So if they couldn't, yeah. what does that imply for all these other algorithms that are out there? All these other models that are deployed and making highly consequential decisions for people that allocate resources. And if you look at the EU AI Act, actually almost all the use cases that development is interested in, international development, things around education, access to finance and banking, um, it, you know, access to agro-fertilizer inputs. There are efforts to be using models to disperse that to the right farmers in the right amount at the right time. Absolutely, efficiency, effectiveness, especially with low resources, I see the reason why you'd wanna deploy that. And yet, there are all sorts of ways that inequalities are not only remade through that, but they actually become amplified. Yes. Because when an AI model makes a decision, then that decision becomes a new data point in reality. And that's how we get that amplification effect. And so I think in the social impact sector, folks are really excited about doing good as am I, and I wanna figure that out. But we need to really pause and say, the EU AI Act has categorized almost every use case as high risk because it allocates resources that influence people's lives. If you haven't yet played around, I highly encourage you to go into an AI image generator. I think they're amazing tools for visualizing bias and inequality in AI. So it's harder to see that with chat GPT, with text-based outputs, but you can actually visualize it with yeah. image generators. I uh, turned 40 this year. I cannot believe that. Uh, but I put into an image, image generator a 40-year-old woman. And what came out was a woman with loads of wrinkles, with a ton of gray hair. I had not specified race. And so, of course, it provided a white woman a very wealthy looking woman that had big boobs and a thin waist. <laughs> That's not me. And so you can see all these ways in which inequalities get embedded into these models. And I really want us to take it seriously. Oh, but it is serious. That is in cash. Well, we now have a whole world of technology that's even more biased than a human is biased. Yeah. And and our bias, you said something at the beginning, you learned to diminish your biases by being a child in schools with people who are different. Mm. And without that, remember, we have a story in our mind, and that's that story that we live. When you were describing that, your story was built in a diverse world. 
where you learn to trust people who weren't looking like you or acting like you. Now we've got a um, technology world emerging built on the data that biased world has created to enhance and create more bias. And this isn't and this isn't going to, I mean, if Amazon couldn't fix it, we have a problem. Um, because, you know, if the, if the big guys can't see, what, because I don't know how you do fix it. It's based upon an analysis of data that out of context has no meaning and it's giving it its own meaning. And therefore, it will come up with new stories that are yeah. like new science fiction stories. Absolutely. I mean, when it comes to companies wanting to decrease their risk profiles, Okay, if you the creator of any AI model determines what the definition of success is. If you want to decrease your risk, you can absolutely use an AI model to do that. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you are interested in some sort of relationship with society that you don't want to be, you know, disproportionately denying uh, African American individuals or people of color or minoritized communities in whatever society you're operating in, if you don't want to disproportionately uh, deny them loans, then you need to go back and work with your team to change how that's going to operate. A lot of people tend to say garbage in, garbage out. And they're often talking about the quality of the data. And I think actually, if we abstract away a little bit from that, I wish people in AI, I encourage all of you to start thinking instead of garbage in, garbage out, think inequalities in, inequalities out. Because the world is an unequal place and all AI is doing is taking that inequality and predicting it forward in time. Yeah. Now, if you're, de if you're decreasing the risk profile, you could say, that qualifies as a minimum viable product. I disagree with that decision personally um, because I'm interested in stakeholder value and company relationships with society. But I, <laughs> we, we need ways to really understand this because in the social impact sector, inequalities in, inequalities out is unacceptable. That doesn't work. And so we need to be thinking very deeply about what is it that we want coming out of what might be our business imperative or use case for using this model and what is our desired social relationship uh, with our different consumer groups. And this is also about consumer trust. Um, well, I, people I'm glad are going to wake that. up. That's just what <laughs> I was going to say. So the biggest problem uh, in some ways is that if you trust it to be I'm biased and equal, and it's yeah. fundamentally not, then we've built a whole additional world that's going to accelerate, amplify the bad things, and not necessarily create a better world at all. And that leaves yeah. us with lots of work for, um, for all of us to do. Because if you don't understand what you don't understand, and you're going to think of this as truth, as opposed to just big data coming back and, and doing stuff, you're going to have a hard time living in a world that's being influenced by bad by bad data. It, it, this has been a wonderful conversation. I, I'm unhappy stopping it, so we will have to continue it in six months or so, but it is time to wrap up. Emily, a couple of things you want the listener or the viewer not to forget, because you know, they often remember the end better than the beginning. And this has been a rich conversation I've been tracking, but I have a hunch they're going to go back and watch it again to hear the threads that took you from where you were to where we are now, because it is a very exciting, scary, emerging time. Some last thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really love uh, your see, feel, think model. And I was sort of thinking about that with respect to AI. And so I really want to encourage people to see AI differently than the way that mainstream media is presenting it, or maybe your CEO is presenting it. <laughs> uh, we need to go beyond the hype. We need to look at who's doing the labor. Where are they located in the world? 
how are they being paid for that work? Who's benefiting from these models? How are those benefits distributed? And really like dive into seeing what AI is in a larger, not only is AI an AI model, a socio-technical construction, but we need to think about AI within society much more broadly. I want you to feel your own power and relationship to AI. I want you to give yourself a moment and take stock. What is your starting relationship to technology? How do you feel about it? Yep. What informed that in your life? Are you starting a relationship with AI where you trust it? Why or why not? And how confident do you feel about talking about AI? There are so many, I hate to say it, but dom predominantly men who are out there talking about AI. And I'm sorry, excuse my language, but they are bullshitting. They <laughs> do not know what AI is about, oh. but they're using it in a way, and that's not everybody. That's a large generalization, absolutely. Um, but I think in offices and workplaces, we need to find ways, and I think a lot of the listenership here is women, and I work predominantly with women and women's empowerment, and I think mm -hmm. there are ways that we need to really build confidence around AI because those discussions, it's, it's hard in an interpersonal uh, conversation with a coworker, it's hard to actually engage with someone who's presenting very confidently, and you might not actually feel super confident. Yes. Um, and so I think we need to be building our confidence that we belong in AI discussions and that we have uh, really our lives and the way we feel about AI. This is a huge moment in society. Yes. Your opinion, your thoughts, your experiences, they all matter and they should give you confidence to have an opinion about AI. Um, I want people to really think about what kind of society do you want to live in? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about surveillance? Where do you get your news from? Why do you trust that news? How do you feel about the role social media plays in your life? So I want you to think and reflect on all of that. Um, but lastly, I think we need to start doing when it comes to AI. Everybody take time, upskill in AI and experiment. Nobody knows what they're doing. You need to go into AI, interact with ChatGPT as if you're learning how to ride a bicycle. Like you don't expect yourself to go in knowing how to ride a bicycle. So don't expect that of yourself in your relationship with AI models. Experiment, try different things. There are all sorts of different opportunities uh, out there to interact with AI models. And lastly, uh, get a new role. Uh, volunteer uh, schools are interested in adopting AI, but join a parent teacher association like subcommittee about AI in the schools, volunteer at your company for if there's an AI policy that needs to get written, get in the game. Yep. Um, so really start doing when it comes to AI. Thank you for expanding my see, feel, think and do. <laughs> um, just to put in context, see, feel, think and do, um, I'll give you two sort of parting last thoughts. Many years ago, I was an executive at a savings bank and I bought their first computer. Great. You can only imagine the hatred in the eyes of the secretary yes. who had selectric typewriters. It was IBM country and they were perfectly happy with whiteout. And what will I do with my whiteout? And how will this, it was a whole new way of seeing, feeling, thinking, and doing. And they initially rejected it. And of course, they can go back. You know, I installed ATMs. ATMs were going to kill all of the tellers. Didn't do that at all. But the interesting part is how the humans are, resist the new and the unfamiliar. It protects them. They don't want a lion coming around the bend to eat them for dinner. And so the human mind has evolved to be a resistor to the new. If it's not familiar, you flee it, you fear it, you appease it, you fight it, but you don't love it. And when you do love it, you don't know what you're loving because you haven't taken the time to really understand it. And so yeah. in some ways, I feel like it's white out. You know, the world I know today, I won't be able to use, but tomorrow, I don't know really how to use that either. And I hate 
to be betwixt and between. I'm going to dig a hole and be an ostrich and not come out, but you have to come out because this yeah. is a way, even for that lovely lady who needed to eat. I mean, what we really need to do is apply our creative curiosity and smarts to help humans live better lives. All humans. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And this has been absolutely a delicious, wonderful conversation with Dr. Emily Springer. Um, if they want to reach you, what's the best place to get to you? Your website or LinkedIn? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you want to reach me, uh, you can check out my consulting company website, which is technosocioadvisory.com. Uh, there, I sort of have different opportunities uh, and roles that I could play uh, in different companies or projects. And then if you're interested in upskilling in AI, I try to take a, certainly a, a concepts approach and really help people build from the ground up. So I don't run tips and tricks AI training, which is a <laughs> lot of what I'm seeing out there. I run... I want to teach you how to think really critically about this and build your capacity so you can go forward and think critically about what's coming up in your life, whether that's in your personal life or in the office in, in any way. Um, so if you're interested in that, I do AI uh, on-demand AI trainings at the inclusive AI lab Dot com And I also do custom trainings for businesses if folks are interested in that. We're going to push this out and celebrate the opportunity to share Dr. Emily Springer's story with all of you. And you share it because uh, these are times, they are changing fast. Humans don't like to change. So it's time to make change your friend. And I preach that often so that you can see, yes. feel, and think in new ways. The times, they are changing. My books, I always like to end with, you know, go read more. My book, On the Brink, yes. Lens to Take Your Business to New Heights. Amazon loves you. Um, and it is all about how a little anthropology can help your business see what's right there and it gets stuck. Now, rethink smashing the myths of women in business. Need a woman who smashed that myth. And Women Mean Business just came out in September 2023. It's going gangbusters and it is just more fun to share the successes of women, women with businesses of purpose and women who just want to make the world a better place. And I, I do too. This has been wonderful. Thank you for joining me today. I truly appreciated it. Thank you so much. Saying goodbye now. Remember, our job is to take your observations, turn them into innovations. That's what a little anthropology can do or sociology, but the times they are changing. So time to see and then make it happen. Bye-bye now.